Hey, welcome friends. Dave Pilatus, Canon Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. And we're at Hungry Horse Reservoir, and you're looking at an osprey nest. I've been here before in the winter, but uh, we're back and mom's in the nest. It's a beautiful day. It's about 88 degrees out right now, and uh, got a little bit of traffic, but not much. So, I mean, it's almost worth staying on this for the entire time, but we're gonna come back and we're gonna discuss the second part in Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, the book. So I'm gonna bring it back and I'll try to come back to this later. Kinda of get the whole view of what we're looking at right here. Give you a scan. You can see this is just a gorgeous area. We're getting some smoke right now from a fire over on the uh, west side of Flathead Reservoir. But we're going to do the best we can with the road noise and uh, a variety of other things that will guarantee to annoy you. So. A gorgeous day. Now, if you want to see the first part I did about this on Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, the link is going to be below this in description of the video. But this is the second part. And I'm going to introduce you <coughs> to how the Department of the Interior came to studying at Skinwalker Ranch. Now, one of the authors of this book is a, a man named James Lakatsky. And Lakatsky was a program manager at the Department of, at the DIA. And part of that effort was to come up with materials to study. Well, he actually read Knapp and Kelleher's first book about Skinwalker Ranch. And he thought that it was fascinating. And he got, his, got permission from his powers to be in March 2007 to write a letter to Robert Bigelow on DIA letterhead. So, June 19, 2007, he writes the letter. June 26, 2007, things were already in motion and Bigelow flew Lukatsky to Skinwalker Ranch to set a meeting and to see what they could come up with together. Now, <clears throat> while Lakatsky was at the ranch meeting with the powers to be under Bigelow's realm, he was in a building and he actually saw something floating through the air behind another individual inside the building. And he was sold that he had to do this. Now, Whatever the entities are there, they had to have known who he was. And if they made it interesting enough, the DIA was going to show up. Well, they fulfilled the task. Now, on page 56 of the book, they talk about something in my research that I've talked about with you many times in the past. And that is a cone of silence that I've experienced in the wilderness and other people in the village have experienced it as well. And this book talks about it. And they said that a cone of silence came over an area in which they were studying. Well, to me, that's pretty fascinating. And that's a pretty big parallel to what we've experienced as well. Now, at some point, the DIA went under contract. They sent a female investigator out to work with Col Colm Kelleher. And while they were out there, both of them saw an animal about the size that was described as a 150 pound pig. And both of them saw it pass within about 50 feet of Kelleher and described it as dinosaur-like with spines on its back 
and they saw it run away and disappear and they never saw it again now Juliet Witt was from DIA that was one of the investigators after that incident she requested from Kelleher that they have an armed security person in her room with her at all times that's how shook up she was now the book also describes that Witt goes back to Maryland after finishing her stint at the ranch and she has his hitchhikers that follow her and the hitchhiking incident was so bad that her roommate a male had to move out couldn't take it anymore again pretty phenomenal for a seasoned DIA investigator now the book goes on to talk about another investigation that Bass at the time, that was the name they were using. They were investigating an incident between Ventura and Santa Clarita, California, in a town called Legal. Some people may call it Legal. But this is the map. Get this just right for you. But this is Ventura. This is Culver City. This is legal out in the middle of nowhere. Now, what's fascinating about this, there's a giant trench out in this area off the Southern California coast. And UFOs have been seen in this area for years and years and years. So, when I read this story about legal, I immediately said, that ah, fits the profile. So Bass hears about this 20 acre property almost in the middle of the city where this family had seen a silver gray blue flashing light in the field above their farm they also saw something open on the horizon and this thing came out and they both stated it was the most amazing thing they ever saw so Bass deployed three different investigators to simultaneously investigate this, along with a series of video cameras trying to collect some evidence. So one of the people that owned the property had videoed on their phone this thing in the sky and shown it to investigators. Now, on July 27th, when this is in 2009, when they were doing this investigation, unusual type, and I don't know what it was, but unusual type things showed up on the Bass Investigator's camcorder. And then three of the camcorders shut down on their own, which is very, very indicative of whenever you investigate UFOs. There's some type of effect that it has on batteries. Well, then the investigators asked the people to send them the files that they had on their phone of this incident. And when the people went to send them, all the files on the phone disappeared, according to the Bass investigators. Now, this is all being laid out for you <clears throat> because it's important to understand that a pattern develops in these type of investigations. So, the next thing the book talks about is blue orbs. I've heard of white, orange, blue, yellow. Well, they start talking about blue orbs. And a fascinating story. A dad and his daughter are driving in an area south of Bend, Oregon. And as they're driving along on Highway 20 on May 5th, 2005, they both see three orbs come at them on the highway. And they pass through their vehicle. And two out of the three flew into the vehicle. And one of the blue orbs entered the left arm of the dad and exited at the chest level at the bicep 
level of the body. They were both mightily shook up by it. Bass investigators found it to be extremely credible. The people said that they felt burned. They said the orbs were about the size of a softball and both of them were nauseous afterwards. The dad lost hair on the left side of his head. Weeks later, he started gaining weight uncontrollably. Weeks after, he's diagnosed with ductal carcinoma. Surgery was performed on May 14, 2007. It was biopsied. It had not metastasized. By 2008, he had no radiation, no chemo, but had just general malaise. It was a blood-related issue associated with a blue orb. Now, the book goes on and starts talking about this blue orb association, not with white, yellow, green, just blues. And that's weird. I've never heard this angle of it before. Now, there was an association with a blue orb at Skinwalker Ranch. Prior to Mr. Bigelow purchasing the property, the rancher there had dogs, like most ranchers do. And the rancher sees this blue orb fly towards him over the property. Dogs are going crazy and the blue orb is staying just high enough off the ground so the dogs jumping can't get to it. Almost like he's teasing the dogs. Then it passes the rancher and goes into the trees. Dogs chase the orb into the trees. And the rancher hears a bunch of yelping, crying. And the rancher makes a decision not to go back into those woods until the next morning. His dogs don't come out. The next morning, he finds three black spots, almost greasy spots in the ground. And he surmised it had to be his dogs. Never saw his dogs again. Now, what about that? Well, if this is controlled by an intelligence entity, intelligent entity, why would it tease the dogs like that and then entice them into the forest to kill them? It seems pretty, pretty angry sort of entity. Another blue orb story. Two people are walking their dog in Maryland. The orb goes right in between the people and grazes a woman's shoulder. The next day, her body hurt. She had headaches. That night, her husband finds her in bed lifeless. Extreme headache. Went to a physical, had weeks of test. She had an autoimmune thyroid disease that leveled her. Directly blue orb related according to their research. Now, another ranch victim was an investigator who went home and his wife had systematic lupus flare up immediately within the three days he got home. And then they confirmed that each of the 10 ranch security officers that they used over time had brought something home to their family that was confirmed through interviews with family members. Now, James Lukatsky had only a few minor anomalies at his house, all related to his wife. Now, what's fascinating about all of this is that it would appear that very few of the actual investigators at the ranch had an issue with an anomaly at their house. But almost on each occasion, it affected either the wife, the kids, or the family friends. Figure that one out. Now they related a story which really kind of brings us full, full circle. In 1973, Lawrence Livermore Labs 
California, was doing research on a man named Yuri Geller. U-R-I Geller, G-E-L-L-E-R. And Geller had some fantastic paranormal abilities. Look him up, fascinating person. Well, some of the people involved in the board of directors of Bass had stated that they worked on this Geller testing program. And many of the crew at the time felt as though that the crew was possessed and tormented and sometimes a hallucinating spirit was possessing them. And to that end, they became really nervous about continuing with the project. They described things flying in the room, giant birds in the house, mythological birds and mammals all around them all the time. And that was with the Geller research. Now, physicist Hal Pudoff was involved in the ranch research and the Geller investigation. That's quite a coincidence. Now, in December, 2000, December 11, 2009, there was a meeting that Bass officials had with the Special Investigations Office at the Air Force. And Bass people, that would include Colm Kelleher, asked for data on UFO incursions over an Air Force base in Michigan, Maine, Montana, and North Dakota, all the northern rim of the United States. And the Air Force told them at the time that they could see what they could do. Now, Jack Angelo was the director of ops and special ops for Air Force Special Investigations. And he was the one in the meeting calling the shots. Now, I know a little bit about this because I've done a lot of research into Malmstrom Air Force Base and the incursions they had by UFOs. And it was all, it was all in a specific period of time. And it seems like everything kind of went crazy there. They reported that a UFO went over a missile silo and the people that monitor the readiness of our missiles and things, everything shut down. Security officers said that there was something hovering above one of the silos. Everybody ran up on top and saw this classic type UFO hovering above the silo. Now, you'd think that'd be a national defense issue, wouldn't you? But our government just doesn't want to even acknowledge it or talk about it. Now, just recently, they have started to acknowledge this type of stuff, but the truth of the matter is, can you imagine if Russia, China had this ability to shut down our missile silos? Yeah, that's, that's pretty heavy stuff, no matter what you think. But Bass officials asked for the data and all of the reports associated with these incursions at these bases. Now, I'm going to end this report right here for a couple of reasons. I want to go back and say the blue orb issue. If anybody out there's had an incident with a blue orb, I want to hear about it and uh, where it was, how it happened. And if there's anybody out there that has actually touched an orb of any color, I'm interested. Now, I've been told from some competent people that the Skinwalker series for next year is already starting to film which is a good sign. I'm, I'm happy for the team that they got that done. Now, George Kelleher and Lekatsky, the authors of this book, I gotta say, I haven't been disappointed. It's, uh, it's an easy read. If you have an open mind, if you understand that the people that they are using to investigate this are some of the most credible in the world, the idea that Colm Kelleher got our Defense Department to put up bucks to investigate a paranormal entity is unbelievable. And it shows his credibility and integrity to grab the government and bring him in on a big investigation like this. Very impressive. So, that's the uh, segment for this week. 
Uh, I'll give you another scan around of what things look like and have a safe, fun summer. And I'll give you a little narration, narration as we go along here. So you're looking south right now. And this reservoir extends for almost 20 miles in that direction. The road on the west side, which we are on right now, give you a scan of this. It looks like, oh, great road, Dave. Yeah, it's paved for about another mile. And then it turns to dirt. And then this winter, they lost the road about 30 miles back on the west side. It used to be a big loop road. Now it, uh, it ends abruptly out there, so you can't get past the slide. Now with this, you can go along the east side road, which does follow the lake and spots, and uh, eventually get to the end. There's a ranger station at the far end of the lake. I love watching this bird. hanging out. How would you like to have that as your office? He probably has a visual on, I don't know, three or four miles going south of the lake and the dam's on behind us, so he's got a pretty darn good view. Horse Reservoir, beautiful summer day. Hope you guys enjoyed the segment. Uh, make a comment if you'd like on the video. Keep your th give us a thumbs up if you like the segment as it's going, and uh, we'll be back soon with the next chapter. Politus out.